Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have a really great program today um, about climate change and understanding the ways that climate change is a human rights issue. We have a really great panel um, today. But before we get started, um, I just wanted to give out the disclaimer that all comments of the moderators and guests of our programs represent the thoughts of each individual and do not represent an official, official position of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Now, I want to introduce our moderator today. Also, happy Earth Day. I need to say that's the beginning. Um, <laughs> our moderator is Catherine Catalano. She is a deputy director of the Center for, I'm sorry, the Center for Climate Health and Equity at the American Public Health Association. Um, thank you for joining us, Catherine, and now I will turn it over to you to introduce the rest of our guests. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be celebrating Earth Day with all of you. Um, I am very pleased to introduce our panelists for this conversation today on understanding climate change as a human rights issue. Um, we'll start uh, as the slide tells me with Dr. Jairo Garcia. Um, he is the CEO of Urban Climate Nexus, a researcher and professor of climate policies in sustainable cities, UN Habitat Regional Curator for North America, and SDGs Educator Fellow. Um, Dr. Garcia is a former director of climate policy with the city of Atlanta and the lead author of Atlanta's Climate Action Plan. Um, now we can move, sorry, <laughs> dancing on the slides. Um, great. And then we also have Lauren Rizzi, um, who is the program director of the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. Uh, she works with policymakers, practitioners, donors, and researchers to generate innovative transdisciplinary solutions to development and security challenges related to environmental change and natural resource management. And we also have Dr. Andrew Rosenberg. Um, who is the director of the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He has more than 30 years of experience in government service and academic and nonprofit leadership. Welcome to all three of our panelists today. Um, great, so I know we only have an hour here, so I will dive right in um, so we can start this great conversation. Um, you know, this, this is a program on climate and human rights, so we thought we would start with an overview of climate change um, and the you know, causes and um, impacts on our society. So uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Garcia to start us out today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm sorry, uh, but the allergies are killing me talking about climate change. Allergies are terrible here uh, during this time of the year. Uh, let, me, let me start. Uh, thank you again for the introduction. I teach classes in uh, climate change policies and sustainable urban cities at the Georgia City of Technology. Uh, so I got have 10 minutes that I write here in my, my timer to describe something that usually I teach during the entire semester. But I want to start with that. I probably you already, you guys can see this picture. This picture is a real picture from from a, uh, from a, a spaceship in the atmosphere, and basically showing uh, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is basically what makes the Earth what it is. So if we have life in Earth, and we don't have life in other planets, is because that uh, atmosphere, that basically are gases, and gases that is, is stay in equilibrium. And basically everything that we love, I mean, you think about everything that you can possibly love, you know, your parents, your kids, your dogs, the trees, the flowers, any, anything that you love is protected by the atmosphere, is protected by land layer that unfortunately, unfortunately for other planets, they don't have it, we do have it. However, we, nobody's protecting the atmosphere, nobody is protected. So right now we are dumping waste, like there is no tomorrow and nobody cares about what we have dumping there. Like, like we don't care, we don't care about what we are dumping there. And one of the things that we are dumping that is very, very traumatic is CO2, because CO2, which is carbon, it goes up, but it doesn't go to outside the atmosphere, it stays there. So if you have been in the old churches or you burn a lot of candles inside your house, you wanna notice a, a dark a layer in the ceiling uh, from the carbon that you are burning. So the carbon, it just stays there, it goes up and then doesn't go anywhere else, it stays there. So that's what it happened with the atmosphere. So very quickly, uh, here is what is happening. So you see at the left, 
how the earth for billions of years has been in equilibrium. The equilibrium is the sun sends us a lot of energy for radiation, it gets to the atmosphere, it warms us, right? And then from the ice caps and other systems, we reflect some, uh, some radiation back to space and then go back to space. So that's what has happened for many, 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 many billions of years. And now when we are putting all our waste from our cars, from the food that we eat, from our airplanes, from all our industries, we are covering the beautiful blue layer that you saw, we are covered with dark carbon. And that is a problem because when you, we do that, the radiation gets in, but it cannot get out. And it produces something that is called greenhouse effect that you probably have seen when you go to the botanical garden, you go to the greenhouse, it's like, why wow, this is warmer? It's because this effect. So in that case, in the case of the, uh, the bot botanical garden is because they have windows, they have uh, bureaus, windows that, that stop the radiation from uh, being irradiated back to space. But in this case is the atmosphere, unfortunately. So we have plenty of evidence that uh, we are tracking the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and we see that it's increasing year by year. And with the increase of carbon also increasing the temperatures. So there is a correlation there, but also a causation. We know when we accumulate carbon in a space, then it, it, it gets warmer because it's the greenhouse gas effect. So this is physics. This is not about believing or not. This is just physics. You know, you drop something on the floor, it's, it's gonna fail. You know, uh, it's just physics. Uh, and so this, is when the people ask me like, oh, uh, do you believe in climate change? This is not about believing. This is about, we are doing this. We are emitting a lot of carbon emissions. You get it trapped in the atmosphere and it produces the greenhouse gas effect uh, uh, warming the planet. Uh, so here is the amount of carbon that we are sending to, to uh, to, this, uh, uh, to the atmosphere in gigatons. And we said, oh, what is that, Dr. Garcia? What is that? So let me put you an example, what, how much carbon we are putting in the atmosphere. So, you know, everybody knows that hopefully an elephant, you have seen an elephant, right? So it is there in the picture, but look at this. We are, because we are able to quantify that, uh, we are putting 30 million gigatons of carbon per year. 30 million, 30, 30, 37, uh, 37 gigatons. 37 gigatons means it's 37,000 megatons. If we divide it by 365, so basically we are emitting 100 megatons of carbon per day. If one elephant tons, uh, uh, weighs two tons, so 100 megatons divided by two, that means that we are putting in the atmosphere 50 million elephants per day. 50 million, 50 million elephants per day. But this is the feed, it's accumulated. So today we put 50 million. Yesterday, 50 million is 100. Before yesterday, 50 million, 150. And before yesterday, another 50 million. And before yesterday, and last week, and two weeks ago, and three weeks ago, and six months ago, and every single day since the industrial revolution, we have put 50 million elephants per day in the atmosphere. If you don't believe that this is a big number, I don't know why it could be, but I just go there and make the math. And somebody just makes me mad when people say, oh, humans cannot do that. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We can destroy the planet, and we are doing it. We are destroying the planet and we are doing it if we don't change our ways. We change our way. What we need to do, produce our carbon emissions. This is way back from the NASA 400,000 years ago. And you can see that the last century, you see the peak in the last few years, uh, the peaks in the 1950s, we never had experienced such amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And we know why it's doing it. We are doing it with our industries, et cetera. So what, how how we know that? Well, the air is is, is is increasing in temperature. When there is a lot of heat, you know, the, the ice is gonna is melting. So the glaciers and the ice caps are melting. Just ask any person that going to the uh, ski resort. You, you see less and less less ice or uh, snow. And then that all the water goes to our rivers and you see a lot of floods. And then you see the sea level increasing because we are measuring and we see that all vapor is going up the atmosphere and we see the intensity of the rains. We see over and over and over and over and over and over again. So what is happening right now is that uh, the temperature of the air is warming alarming dates, alarming rate. And then we talk about in, in the scientific community to talk about Celsius, because that's most of the world is talking about Celsius. We hear in Fahrenheit, but because this is an international problem, we talk about Celsius. So in Celsius, the body of the human being, the regular body, is 36, 36 Celsius. You know? uh, so if we increase for two degrees, that would be hyperexia, meaning that when you're gonna have a fever and you have to take you to the hospital and then increase that, you're gonna kill the person. That is happening with the planet. 
if the, if the temperature increases beyond two Celsius, basically, the, uh, and there is no hospital that we can take the planet. Basically, we're gonna kill the planet as we know it. You see here that those, uh, those segments basically showing the temperatures of the United States and the, 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 the world from the 1800s. And as you can see, those variations, sometimes, you know, we have a lot of reds here, and it's because the temperature increases because you know we have war, we have droughts, etc. But as you can see, there is a, con a consistent turn to the red, which is a clear indication that our planet is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And then very quickly, uh, before I finish, like, oh, Dr. Garcia, why, why is it so cold today? Oh, why is it so cold today? So first of all, because it's cold today, doesn't mean that the rest of the year it was not warm, okay? And second of all, is because we are breaking that barrier that is protecting the North Pole. We are protecting that is, is called the, the, uh, the uh, we, we, are, we are basically changing the temperature that is getting so warmer in the sun atmosphere that the cold that is in the North Pole is going down. Because that is physics. If you, for instance, have a barbecue and you open the door, you see that the cold air goes out, right? Because it's outside, it's hot. So the cold that is supposed to stay inside the house that is protected, something that is called the vortex. The vortex protects that, the, uh, the North Pole. And because the temperature is getting so warm, the vortex is, is, is breaking. So basically the door that we have into the house that is cool and the barbecue outside is broken. So all the cold air that in North Pole is going out. But if you go to the North Pole, you see that the temperatures are increasing. This year we had the highest temperature in the North Pole ever recorded in history, ever recorded, even though here in the United States was cold, but we understand because the cold that's supposed to be there is getting south. But it's gonna be to the point that it's not gonna be more, more cold there everything is gonna be warmer. And people say, oh, that's fantastic. So we can, you know, plant trees in, in, uh, in, uh, in the North Pole. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is absolutely absurd because the rest of the, the, rest of the planet is gonna be a desert to the point that for instance, here in Georgia, we're gonna have the temperature of, of Mexico. We're gonna have a desert here. How many people in Georgia want to have a desert here? I don't know, but I, I live here. I don't want to have that, that temperature here. So this is something that we need to address very seriously, I talk about the vortex, but I'm not gonna spend more time explaining that. But this is just a very serious uh, social justice problem. Why? Because the people that are being affected the most are the poor people. Right now, the tropics uh, is where the temperatures are increasing the most, and those people are having enormous droughts. What happened is that, oh, who cares about these people, right? Well, those people are need to live somewhere, and because they don't, can, don't live there, Guess what? They are coming to the United States or they are going to Europe. You know, with the Syria crisis, with the Central America crisis of immigrants is because climate change. And then the other thing that I wanna mention is here, for instance, in Atlanta, more people die from heat strokes than the entire population of the United States are dying from hurricanes and tornadoes combined. And why those people are dying? Because they cannot afford to pay the bill, the electric bill for uh, during the summer, which is extremely high here in Atlanta. So we are killing the poor people. We are killing the poor people and now, and sooner or later, it's gonna hit us all because climate change doesn't discriminate. So sooner or later, doesn't matter, doesn't, doesn't matter how much money you have, there is no place on earth that you can hide. Climate change is gonna get you down. So we better get it uh, with the scientific community, get it better with our, our members of the community and demand climate action absolutely right now the scientific communities give us the alarm. If we don't take action now, with the consequences are gonna be devastating. So with that, I want to just go the floor back to, uh, to Katherine. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. You just covered an astounding amount of ground in 10 minutes. <laughs> really appreciate that overview for, for the viewers today of um, climate change, why it's a problem, why it's so urgent. Um, it was great hearing from you on all of those fronts. And, you know, you touched on this, but it, in addition to us killing the planet and causing warming and causing all of that, this has just such an astounding human impact. And it's, it's, it's really about climate change um, killing us, killing humans uh, is, is a huge part of this conversation. I'm going to touch a little bit on that now. Um, Again, I'm from the American Public Health Association. Um, we work on a wide variety of public health issues, um, but climate change really does pose one of the most significant public health threats today. Um, just all of the interconnected impacts on human health. You know, um, Dr. Garcia spoke about 
extreme heat and how that impacts folks and sends them to the hospital. Um, those heat waves are just becoming more and more intense. Um, it's so dangerous for people, especially outdoor workers, especially people that don't um, have consistent air conditioning. Um, extreme heat can also make cardiovascular illnesses worse. And we see that a lot. Um, also, you know, warmer temperatures and changes in precipitation um, from, from climate change um, can expand the geographic range of disease carrying insects and vector borne diseases. Um, that another, being another health impact that is really serious um, from climate change. Um, I mean, it's from greenhouse gas emissions making air quality worse. Um, you know, trapping pollution um, at the surface level here and increasing allergens that aggravate respiratory and cardiovascular illnesses. Um, you're seeing a lot more, you know, especially in communities that see a much greater concentration of those air pollutants, um, particularly communities of color and low income communities, communities in urban areas near um, highways and freight corridors. Um, those, those communities are seeing even higher rates of asthma um, particularly childhood asthma. Um, so all of these are, are interconnected. They can, they can build on one another. Um, obviously, there's also climate change. These increased carbon emissions in the atmosphere um, lead to pretty extreme weather, um, be, it, be it intense storms um, that put people's health and safety in danger um, and lead to you know, a lot of issues with stormwater and that impacts our health. Um, also, but all the way to the other end on drought, um, causing more frequent and intense wildfires, which cause really horrible air quality issues for people, um, and also drought that impacts our food systems um, and makes it harder for folks all over the world in different areas to have access to healthy and abundant food sources. So, I mean, that is as quickly as I can go through some of these really terrible um, health public health issues that come from climate change, you know, not even considering the mental health impacts um, for the entire global population of, climate, of the climate crisis, from folks uh, dealing with trauma from uh, natural disasters to uh, young people who are just dealing with an intense amount of climate anxiety right now, um, wondering what their future is gonna look like, fighting and marching and being incredibly inspiring advocates, but also dealing with the toll that that takes um, having to fight for their future in a world where they feel like leaders aren't listening. Um, so that, that mental health impact is, is really important to consider as well. So that's just a little bit of an overview there um, for me on, on really keeping those um, public health impacts of climate change in mind. And again, especially, you know, Dr. Christy, Garcia talked about folks having to leave their homes in certain parts of the world. Um, those who suffer the most of these public health impacts from climate change and all of the impacts into climate change tend to be the ones that have the, the countries and the people who have contributed the least to it. The world's wealthiest nations in the, in the global north, we have been responsible for so much of these emissions. Um, and other people are feeling its impacts so much more acutely on a global scale and here in America, um, where environmental justice communities and frontline communities are bearing so many, so many of the burdens of climate change and its health impacts um, here near where you live, viewers. <laughs> so um, just really uh, want to stress the, the human element of this crisis and, and how urgent it is to continue addressing this by reducing emissions, by investing in resilience and adaptation, by educating and spreading awareness and passing ambitious climate policies that are really going to get us where we need to go, not just to, to protect our own people here, but to clean up the mess we made on a global scale, um, to be frank. So that is my time on the public health impacts of climate change. Um, we have a couple other angles to share with our viewers today. Um, so I will go ahead and pass it to uh, Lauren Weezy to talk about the human rights um, lens on climate change. 
Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Dr. Garcia and Catherine for you know, laying a pretty strong foundation for the discussion and, and some of the complex ways that climate change is reshaping our world. I wanna start with the caveat that I am not a human rights expert, um, but while my entry point for this conversation is really focused on how can we create a more climate resilient world, I've come to understand that responses to climate change uh, must be underpinned by issues of equity, justice, and human rights in order for those responses to be effective. Uh, Dr. James Gatti wrote a piece for us recently at the Wilson Center, and he, he says that without centering race, identity, and indigeneity, climate responses will miss the mark. And I think I've carried that uh, forward in each of the conversations I've had subsequently. So climate change has the potential and indeed already is magnifying the hardships and challenges that households, that communities, that countries are facing in their daily lives. In short, climate change is and will increasingly act as a risk multiplier, whether through slow onset impacts like drought and rising sea levels or shocks like wildfires and intense hurricanes. Climate impacts have immediate effects, but they also have cumulative effects that compound over time. So for those people already living on the edge who struggle to put food on the table, to send their kids to school, to provide safe, clean drinking water, those pressures that they're already feeling in their daily lives are exacerbated by climate change. In many of the places most exposed to climate change, populations are impoverished or marginalized and the governing mechanisms, the institutions, the systems necessarily, necessary to help populations adapt to climate change are lacking. And the systems that do exist will also feel the pressure of climate change, further diminishing their ability to effectively protect populations, whether through preparation, mitigation, or response. And I should mention that many of these communities are the least responsible for climate change itself. Many of you will remember the one-two punch of hurricanes Eta and Iota in Central America in 2020. The hurricanes left water systems contaminated, exposing over 1.5 million children to diseases. There were severe damage to over 1,200 schools, and at least 1.5 million people were displaced. This is in a region struggling with forced displacement, violence, corruption, and unemployment. But you can also look north to our own country to see how climate change disproportionately worsens conditions for marginalized groups. So you might remember the Texas freeze last year uh, where there were major power outages. Some people with the means to get out of town escaped, some even to Mexico, or they stocked up on essentials. The storm didn't discriminate though in terms of where power was knocked out, but for people of color and low-income communities who didn't have easy access to cars or money to stockpile supplies, the immediate effects were harder hitting. One group provide that, uh, provided groceries to families in need reported that 90% of those families were black or Latino. But the impacts are also longer lasting for marginalized groups, for people whose income is reliant on being able to show up to their place of employment. For example, the Texas uh, storm's impact extended beyond the freeze. It takes impoverished and marginalized groups longer to recover from a disaster because they don't have the additional resources, whether financial or otherwise, on which to draw. These inequities are spotlighted by disasters, but they're also pretty evident before a disaster. So these connections are not just important for better understanding climate related risks, like where there are um, potential threats to uh, specific populations or communities, but also reshaping our responses. Um, and I, I, would, I feel like I've gone on a long, long enough here, but I think when we get to the discussion, I think it would be really helpful to think about what that response looks like um, in order to create more resilience. I think there's a lot of opportunities to find co-benefits in climate responses that are both um, supporting human rights and, and supporting a more climate resilient world. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, for our last uh, piece of table setting here, um, I'd like to turn it to Dr. Rosenberg to talk about uh, the disinformation campaigns around climate change and sort of how this issue has that economic lens as well. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'd like to start by making a distinction between disinformation and misinformation. So some people think that there are there's lots of information out of there and some of it just is wrong and it's someone who tweets out something that's incorrect. And of course there is that and there's also a huge variety of opinion and what you, you know, different people might view information in different ways. But there also are concerted campaigns to disinform the public, to disinform the political process and to disinform our public policy. 
And that means someone constructs a campaign that is based on falsehood, has a whole set of tactics to try to either cloud or um, misdirect uh, through disinformation, um, some kind of activity related to public policy or public health. So a classic example of that is of course the tobacco industry um, disinforming people about the effects of tobacco. It wasn't that they didn't know and it wasn't that they you know, were unsure what those effects were. They purposely constructed a campaign um, with tactics that are still used today by many industries and many politicians to confuse the issue and prevent policy solutions from going into place. And that's what I mean by disinformation campaigns. These are carefully thought out, extremely well-funded efforts to disinform the debate over climate change and over many other issues, including our democracy itself, which we'll talk about, I think, in the next section. So let's think about some examples of that. Why would someone want to do this on an economic basis? Well, as Dr. Garcia pointed out, we've had a very long, um, sta reasonably stable environment that humans um, and the systems around us, the ecosystems around us have um, evolved to adapt to. And we have a relatively short industrial period that is, that is based on the conditions that um, effectively we have now in the last 100 to 150 years. Um, so the, the rates at which um, humans adapt are, are relatively slow to the rates of that, that the climate is changing. And business doesn't necessarily want to adapt and societies broader than business don't necessarily want to adapt because right now they know what their successful business model is. So they have no great, to, despite all the rhetoric about you know, businesses being cutting edge and disruptors and, in, and, you know, on the edge and all of that, there are pretty consistent business models. And the fossil fuel industry, of course, is one of those. The chemical industry is, one, is another one of those. The food industry is another, where they have a, a set business model. And really, on an economic basis, they have no real desire to change, not because it's impossible to do something else, but because someone else might have an advantage in a different business model. Secondly, one of the biggest pieces of disinformation you will hear is, well, we cannot afford to do anything about climate change. Well, we can afford what we choose to afford. I mean, we can afford lots of things. We have individuals who can afford to go to space just because they want to. Um, you know, we have individuals that have massive um, yachts and leave incredible lifestyles. We have societies that choose to build sports stadiums. We, we choose how to spend our money. It's not a matter of we don't have any money unless you decide that everything we now spend can only be spent in the way it is. So any money to address climate change would have to be new. So that's an example of confusing the issue. Oh, we couldn't possibly afford this. Well, that's only under the assumption that we don't do anything different that all our money is committed for all and forever and you know, ordained by someone, the constitution or God or whatever. And that's just not the case. That's, we make a specific choice. Um, we don't have, another piece of disinformation is we, the science is uncertain. Well, yes, science always has some uncertainty in it, but there's a big difference between being uncertain about every single detail and result and knowing what you must do. As Dr. Garcia explained, there's no uncertainty that climate is changing and we are warming very fast. There is no uncertainty that there are dramatic impacts from the warming that we know about. Do we need to know exactly the end point to take some action? Well, that's like saying you only treat the patient after they're dead, because that's the only time you know the end point. So, the uncertainty argument is a false argument, but a very effective disinformation strategy. Um, there are other scientists that say that 
either global warming isn't so bad, global warming is good for us, there's going to be, you know, new crops and, you know, CO2 is not a pollutant and all of these other things. And you can find many eminent scientists that say that. Well, first of all, you can't find many, you can find a few <laughs> compared to literally tens of thousands of scientists who look at the evidence and feel it is extremely compelling the other way. And they may be eminent, but one thing that you notice about almost all of the scientists who say this is not a problem is they're not climate scientists. They don't work on climate change. They may be eminent physicists, but they don't work on climate change. They work on cosmology or other areas. But yes, they're eminent scientists. That's fine. But that doesn't mean that therefore they are authoritative in every field. And there is a very small number and they're extremely well-funded and extremely well-publicized. And that helps convince people that this is not an urgent problem. Well, who's funding them? In some cases, it's industries that have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. In other cases, it's political actors who have a vested interest in convincing some portion of the population that they are right and everyone else is wrong or that, that they are somehow being fooled. And so there are extremely well-funded campaigns um, funded by Koch Industries, by the Mercers, by the Scaifes, by many other um, wealthy interests, by the American Petroleum Institute, by most of the major oil companies that confuse the issue and therefore make people throw up their hands and say, I, don't, I really don't know what we should do. Now, finally, I wanna address two other critical pieces of disinformation that I think are really uh, important here. One of them is that you will often hear, well, this is all about choices. You know, Andy Rosenberg, if you are worried about climate change, then you can stop driving a car and you know, take a bicycle to work and don't eat anything. And um, you, know, you don't need to live in a nice house and you don't need to have the heat on in the winter. That's your choice, but why do you inflict that on everyone else? Well, that's as if everyone makes their decisions without influence. You know, um, Drug companies, food companies, oil companies, car companies will say, oh no, we just present choices to the public. Oh really? So you don't really spend any money on advertising trying to convince people to buy your products? Is that how it works? I mean, if it's just about, well, make whatever choices you want, we just prevent, present choices, then nobody would advertise. And I don't exactly think that's how companies work. They have concerted, very well-funded. It's a huge industry convincing people that you need to have you know, a, a, an SUV that can carry several horses in the back seat um, to go to the market because you have one child and maybe your child is gonna have a day when they have 10 friends with them and two horses. And so it, you know, that's the, the image or that you really need to be able to go off road. And maybe some of the people on this call actually do drive off road in a four wheel drive and need to be able to climb mountains and do all those things. But most people don't. Most, most off-road vehicles aren't used off-road. So that's one element here is that you will often hear, well, this is just about your choice. Another one is that the people who are affected, well, that's because, you know, yes, there are poor people, but that's because they don't want to work or they choose to live in areas that are subject by you know, subjected to climate impacts and so on. And let's, you know, stop that nonsense very quickly. People live um, where they can afford to live. They work in jobs that they can obtain and that they can, can um, they hopefully can live on the income. Um, but many, many areas of the United States are, have been redlined, in other words, um, forcing uh, populations, particularly of Black or Indigenous or other people of color, to live in certain areas where the risks are very much higher. Um, there are many areas where, um, you know, you can't say that there's actually a food choice. The only food choice is fast food. You can't say there's a transportation choice. Um, those are things that society designs. These are not the individual choices people make. And so, but it's easy to say that the 
through disinformation, that this isn't a problem that relates to the way that um, either society constructs things or societal racism, or due to climate change, this is because people choose to live there as if someone really would like to live in a place that gets flooded regularly on every high tide and is subject to hurricanes where they have nowhere else to go um, and so on. That's, that's an easy but false narrative that gets constructed over and over and over again. And the final one is that, well, it's a free market, so you can't compel somebody to address climate change. But let's remember that every, all of us live within a system where there are barriers, there are boundaries, there are things you can do um, and things that you can't do in your business. There are things that are incentives, which all oil companies get, all plastics companies get, since a huge amount of our natural gas goes to the plastics industry, not to the to fuel um, and so on. So those are choices that are made along the way. They're not simply a consequence of market forces. And let me stop there since I've depressed you all enough. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Okay, great. Well, that was um, excellent. Thank you to all the panelists for doing that backgrounder for our viewers. Um, quite comprehensive considering it was only 30 minutes. So thank you all. Um, we can get into sort of the, the bulk of our discussion here um, on climate and democracy um, and how they interact and influence each other, you know, sort of government's role in combating climate change. These are some of the things we'd like to talk about today. Um, I'll, I can, I'd like to start here uh, with Lauren, if that's okay. Um, and we can sort of popcorn around a, a sort of an open discussion here. Um, but on those interactions between um, democracy and climate change. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna make a few things, I say a few things and they might not connect to each other, but <laughs> that's how my, my brain is working today. I think, well, first of all, following, um, Andrew, the the disinformation piece is so uh, important to me when it comes to conversations about democracy. Because once you once you plant that seed of doubt in science and in experts and in research and in science communication, once you once you've planted that that doubt in a population that maybe this this science isn't real or the experts are lying or whatever, it it undermines across the board decisions based on evidence <laughs> um, and and uh, and sort of warps decision making right um, and I think that we've seen that with the tobacco industry we've seen it with the oil and gas industry we've seen it with uh, voting in the United States right and like and I don't think that those issues are disconnected from one another because you have this flow of um of of doubt and uh sort of um inability to think critically about what people are being told and or what you, what you're being told uh so i would i would just say that i think the disinformation piece is very much tied to democratic evidence um based decision making and voting and and information that flow of information it's really disruptive um and has real implications for who gets into power and the decisions that they make um the other piece i this so this is not disconnected from that but it's a slightly different angle i think one of the things that has come out of the uh recent so the, the institution i said that is a, the think tank um it's mandated by congress because as a living memorial of president wilson he was the only president to have a phd so we built we bridge policy practice and research right so we're bringing people together from different communities of practice um and across the board on climate, there's a growing recognition that if you are not including the people who are affected by climate change in both the um, the the understanding of what risks they're facing, as well as what solutions are like, what sort of responses are needed, you're going to miss a big piece of the puzzle, right? And so it can't be this top-down response that doesn't include the perspectives and the knowledge of 
local leaders and local groups and and not and local i don't mean to just put them all in the same bucket because there's going to be a wide range of <laughs> of experiences and perspectives at the local level um but you have to have this engagement of decision makers from across the scales of decision making um and you know i think this is more and more reflected in just in how people are doing business the u.s agency for international development for example they they released their uh, climate strategy today um and and locally led development is gets a huge amount of emphasis in that strategy right um and so now we have to put in place the systems to allow that like we don't really you know for development organizations they're the groups on the ground don't have necessarily the capacity and the resources to be able to tap into the the resources um, being granted by the U.S. So it's so there's just there's a lot. If you have to do more than say that we need to include local groups, you need to figure out how to do it um, in ways that don't burden <laughs> those groups. Um, and so I think just in terms of democratic approaches, the the power is supposed to be with the people. So making sure that the people are at the table is a big piece of the climate response. Um, I would also say that, you know, rule of law is incredibly important in both supporting and maintaining the underlying systems that can enable climate resilience. Um, and so in a lot of the places most exposed to climate change, those governments um, are fragile. There, there's a really weak, relationship between society and the government and where you have a weak relationship between the society and government or you have sort of uh, places that are affected by conflict it's going to make it that much harder to um, provide sort of the resources and capacity to respond to climate change and so dem sort of uh, democratic processes and climate responses kind of go hand in hand you have to and and Sorry, I will stop in a minute. But like one of the key things to remember is that because climate change interacts with so many different, you know, political systems, social systems, economic systems, um, you can create climate resilience by supporting women's empowerment. Like you can you can work with across systems to create climate resilience. It doesn't have to be a climate response in order to create climate resilience. It can it can look like you know providing girls education, providing access to family planning and reproductive health services, um, providing sort of uh, alternative food markets, right? Like you're just uh, anything you can do to create more resilient systems in a society is going to help them deal with climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That's a really important reminder, too. Um, we have so many issues as a global society that we're, we're dealing with and can address several of them together. Um, uh, I will, I mean, on this same topic, I just want to keep the flow of conversation going. I don't know, um, Andy, if you have a response to that or more to say on this um, climate and democracy angle. Um, sure. The, um, first of all, I agree with the points that Lauren was making. This is there is a lot about expertise, and the dismissal of expertise that's become part of a political, really a political narrative. Um, you know, I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to say, well, uh, we don't, we shouldn't listen to experts. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I was hiring a plumber, I'd actually want somebody who was trained to be a plumber or an electrician. Um, or, you know, a house painter, somebody who had done it before, to, whether it's in the trades. I don't think that um, ExxonMobil, for example, would say, well, we don't need experts, just, you know, figure out some things to throw together to make gasoline. We don't need to listen. We don't need to do that on a scientific basis. Why would we do that? Um, and if we think about it, everyone has expertise that they've developed, both by lived experience, sometimes by tradition. Um, and certainly um, through science, um, technology, and training. And um, I, I once had a, a U.S. senator say to me, you know, everyone up here on Capitol Hill in the Senate is really, really um, supportive of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics education, they, you know, in schools. They want a lot more science and technology um, 
classes, they want to graduate many, many more students in so-called STEM fields. The only problem is we don't seem to want to listen to the people we STEM educated. And to a large extent, that's true. I mean, it's, it's um, this idea that you don't really need to listen to the people who spend a lot of time um, studying these issues. So um, there is also a science of democracy. That's something my program works on with political scientists. How do you make elections safe in the course of a pandemic? How do you increase voter turnout? What is the actual um, congressional map that would give fairer representation to all the populace within a state, um, which is now made on a, on a political basis, of course. But let's take that as an example of how science relates to democracy. You can draw a map which meets the constitutional goals of one person, one vote, and fair representation and um, you know, not disadvantaging any particular group and all of those things. You can put those into a mathematical formula. You can calculate literally an endless number of possible configurations of congressional or le state legislative district maps. And in fact, we've done that with some of our partners. If you look at the maps that are proposed by state legislatures, they're based on two things, party control and incumbency maintaining the incumbents in safe districts and having more and more control by the party that's in power. Neither of those criteria appear in any state constitution or any other you know, public serving document anywhere. There is no public benefit to single party control or to maintaining safe districts for incumbents. And so if you look at the maps that most state legislatures draw, they bear no relation to scientifically drawn maps that allow for different kind of objective criteria. Should we take that as guidance when we draw districts that represent us in our elected bodies? Yes. Well, guess who gets le left out of not only the democratic process, but then measures to address climate change and measures to protect us from polluting industries and so on. It's exactly the same communities. I mean, voter suppression is a real thing. We know that from the science of democracy as well as from people's lived experience. Campaigns focus on high propensity voters. They don't fo focus on voters who, you know, either the barriers are so high or they don't feel like they're represented. So why would you bother to vote? So voter suppression campaigns are very, very targeted at exactly the same people who in communities who are most impacted by climate change, who are most impacted by the negative effects of industries um, that contribute to climate change, the food industry and so on, voter suppression of farm workers, voter suppression of food chain workers, voter suppression of those who live in environmental justice communities near um, polluting facilities and so on. So it, and, and that's not by accident. Of course, if they had more political power then maybe some of the um, it would be greater uh, justice in terms of dealing with public health and environmental threats. So there is a clear relationship. And again, this is from scientific analysis between public health outcomes and voting rights. And um, yeah, one of my colleagues has done that analysis and it's based on lots of other information as well. Public health outcomes are poorer in places that have weaker voting rights for the residents of that district. So we, we need to draw those connections and we need to, to think about the fact that all of the issues we work on, including climate change, have to rest on the ability to have a more representative and a stronger democracy. Thank you. Great. Um, Dr. Garcia, I'd love to ask you sort of continuing in this vein of um, climate change and, and democracy, what what would you say is the role of governments and our gov government's responsibility for combating climate change and dealing with its impacts? Um, I'd love to hear a little more on that. So yeah, that, that's, that's a, a very important question, but also it just follows uh, what Andrew was talking about, misinformation and the, the choices 
it's costly choices. So I, I live here in, in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't have my choice for electricity. I have to go with the one, uh, what they, they call uh, a regular monopoly uh, that we have. We have a monopoly here and it happens in many, many places in the United States. I don't have a choice. If I go to the supermarket, I don't know what product is coming from somewhere, how much carbon emissions this product is to the other. I don't have that option. I'm not getting that information. So that's where, where the, the government has to intervene. If, the, it, if the, 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 the issue is about choices, they have to give a choices, but don't, don't blame me. Don't ask me to take choices when I don't have any. And especially the people, the people with low income resources, they don't have choices. Uh, Andrew again mentioned about what we call the food deserts, people that don't have access to, uh, to nutritious food. They only have the junk food. So don't ask them to, oh yeah, well, you know, why don't you have you know, good vegetables? It's like, I don't have access to that food. You know, it's just far away and it's too expensive. So you cannot uh, give, uh, give choices when people don't have it. And the, the role of the governor is to give those choices. But more so, I'm gonna share the screen again because I'm gonna show this, this picture here, which I believe is really important, is uh, it's about how much money we are losing on our economy. And it's coming from the government. So this basically, this is from NOAA, which is the National Geographic Administration Agency, which shows the, the, the disasters by billions of dollars. So as you can see, this is the 1980, we are, uh, we are, 10 times spending more dollars in helping the people who has been affected by climate change in the United States. And guess what the money is coming from? Guess where money is coming from? With the tornado that was staring those towns uh, uh, last a few weeks ago in Alabama, uh, which is, uh, is uh, you know, extremely Republican and they don't want the government, guess who get the hand to those people when they were destroyed? The government, the government, you know, uh, Laura was mentioned. Uh, uh, Laura was mentioned in Texas when they uh, they didn't have electricity. Uh, get, get, get helped there when, when Katrina happened, when uh, the the floods in the Midwest of the country, uh, the fires in California. All of that is coming from all of us. It's our money, but that money is coming from the government. The government is us in a democratic country. The government is us. So we want to be sure that that the, uh, in the democratic process, the governor is representing us. The governor is as bad as we in a democracy elected. If we elect bad governor, we're gonna have a government. But we elect good governor, it should be something that is working for the people. So uh, at that case, I do blame the responsibility of the individuals when in a, in a, in a perfect democracy. And that's the reason why as uh, Andrew was mentioning, is that the, the, you know, the Republican Party that is very, very affiliated with the full, uh, fossil fuel industry, uh, they, they try to, to uh, uh, change the districts to avoid the people voting. So the, the poor people that have the, the, uh, the ability to express themselves and to elect the government to represent them don't have the choice. And that is creating a serious problem because right now, as we can see in, in Washington, most of the uh, congressmen are representing the interests of of companies and the fossil fuel and, and just a few are representing the interests of the people. And if that is a problem, then who is gonna help us when something happens with the disasters? More so, the, uh, the, the, uh, the governor is the one that allow us to, to get access to affordable energy. If you think that extracting oil and gas from the ground, taking all of that from the ground, purifying, refining it, distributing it, uh, did you think that that is just uh, just a good business? It's, it's, no, it's, it's no, it's not good business. We are losing billions of dollars, trillions of dollars from our pockets because we are, we, the governor, we are subsidizing those companies. We are giving them money so they can give us affordable, uh, wonderful gasoline because that process is extremely expensive. What is cheap is energy because the sun is shining outside and it's free. That is cheap, the wind is cheap, that energy should be cheaper. And the reason that it's not cheap is because the fossil fuel industry wants to make it expensive. And that's the role of the government to be sure that we remove all those uh, uh, tax breaks and subsidies and all the economic incentives that we are giving to the fossil fuel and put it in clean energy. That's the role that the government has to do. Then, then we can compare, you know, oh, do you want to have an SUV? Pay for the real price. In the economics is what they call negative externalities, is that the people that are not participating in transaction are paying for 
uh, 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 something that they are being affected, including, you know, uh, not only one mentioned about uh, all the public health issues, Catherine, you mentioned about the public health issues that are happening from, from uh, not only climate change, but also from the fossil fuel industry. So again, the government has an extremely important role in order in the democracy, in order to figure out how we move very quickly to the world energy and give us the real choices with the real price of the products that we can choose from. Uh, is telling the market do it because the market is not going to fix anything. The bar for the market was extinctions will go, you know, a species going to extinction. Uh, yeah, people get poor all the time. So because the, there's no fortune the market to be equitable. It's no fortune the market to be environmental responsible. That's the fortune of the market. It's the responsible of we, the people, which is represented in the, in the, in the federal government in a democratic institution. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Um, really important reminders there. And now, you know, we've spent the last 55 minutes sort of outlining all of these very urgent issues for you all. We wanted to wrap up here, um, at least taking a few minutes to talk about uh, what we can all do and what you can do um, as a concerned um, citizen of this world um, on these issues. And obviously we could have an entire webinar on this topic as well. Um, but actually Ed Anderson, one of our viewers um, submitted a question that sets this up really nicely. Um, Ed is a retired science educator and meteorologist in the Atlanta area um, and wants to know how he can contribute um, to uh, informing communities. And you know, particularly he's concerned about uh, the impact of urban heat islands and the growth of these areas. Um, I'd love to, I mean, start out by saying it informing communities and also informing policymakers. I think as a retired educator, um, you've got some some great communication skills there, but really anyone going and speaking to policymakers, again, as we've said, it is there is so much government responsibility here to respond and to act. And we as citizens, you know, we can go and speak to them, especially on a local level. So, you know, you're in the Atlanta area, you know, most cities and urban areas have a climate action plan. Somebody's drafting those, you know, get, get in front of those folks. There's also um, on the urban heat island um, issue, which uh, for viewers, you know, anytime there's a, there's a heat wave, it is significantly warmer in cities, just all the people and the buildings and the energy and the cars. Um, you know, there's someone in that city making decisions about infrastructure investments and, you know, what to replace roads and buildings with, and they could invest in more smart surfaces, reflective and porous surfaces that can reduce city temperatures, you know, while mitigating climate change overall, reducing city temperatures right there, you know, in, you know, more of an immediate local scope. So, they, I mean, there are endless solutions, you know, and luckily, there are lots of groups and organizations, community, frontline communities, environmental justice groups who are engaged in these policy fights that are, you know, able to be plugged in with and learned from. Um, so I definitely encourage reaching out in your area. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this action piece? Um, Andy, go ahead. You know, thank you. Uh, um, two points. The, the first one is um, all of our organizations, I'm sure, have some um, mechanism for people to be engaged. We have something called the Science Network, which sounds like uh, you, the questioner would be qualified for that helps train people on how to be most effective um, in terms of talking to elected officials or writing for local papers. And so um, getting involved in those efforts is, is really, really helpful because you do have credentials, you do have your own experience that you can talk about um, that can be persuasive. You know, despite a lot of the challenges of our political system, constituency still does matter. So calling um, or interacting with elected officials as a constituent, as one of their voters still makes a difference. Uh, and banding together with other constituents in a particular district can make a real difference. So we have something called local teams where we get people together with science interests in, in uh, local communities so that they can advocate on the issues they care about from a science perspective. Um, so don't think that this is all happening at some other level and you can't be part of the discussion. You know, the era of flying in the global expert on a climate change or any other issue is, is sort of over. I mean, people are much more accepting of um, experts within their own community than they are of bringing in somebody from somewhere else. So, you know, the, the, 
people who are your neighbors or who, you know, your children or grandchildren play, you know, sports with or something like that. Talking to people at that level can be much more important than having, you know, just a, a, a global expert that hands down the word. And so I think there is real opportunity to engage. I think all of the organizations on this call and many others, if you go to their websites, you'll see those kinds of opportunities, as Catherine said. This is an all hands on deck moment, folks. I mean, it's not like anyone can really sit back and say, this won't affect me, it will affect you. So yeah, yeah, two, two things. One is obviously uh, have the conversation, have the conversation. We have to talk about it. We need to talk about it all the time with everybody. If you really care about climate change, bring the conversation all the time. And, and sometimes you get in the debate, but, but the science is at your side. And not only, not only the scientific community, but also social sciences. Uh, so the good people are, are on your side. So have these conversations, make people aware of that. We, this is the problem that's gonna affect us all. It's affecting us all right now. And the other important thing is vote. Go there and vote for people that uh, are supporter of climate change, that have a climate change uh, serious agenda. We need to exercise the most powerful a tool that we have in a democracy, which is voting. The, the rest of the things, you know the things, you know, just use your bike, I bike to work every day. I, I am a vegetarian for 25 years. I do my, my homework, but yes, you can do that because it's good for my health, but it's also for, for yourself. But, but collectively, the best thing that we can do is elect representatives that, that take a, a, immediately action on climate change. Yes. Lauren, any closing thoughts? No, I was just, I don't have much to add except to, to underscore what they said. I think this is like, it's a collective problem and the solution is gonna be collective and it's gonna happen at every level from your own house on up. Um, so the decisions that you are making on a daily basis, but I would emphasize just, um, you know, we, we try to, um, we engage with Congress a fair amount at the Wilson Center. It is immensely helpful to have constituents in their home, towns and country or uh, states and um, and um, jurisdictions who are pushing for action on climate change that they are listening to their constituents and it gives us a much more easy way into the conversation if if there's um, if there's expressed interest at home for the for uh, representatives so please do be in touch with your representatives thank you Thank you all so much um, for this very rich conversation. We covered a lot of ground. There were lots of great um, suggestions in there as well as um, in helpful information for viewers. So I hope everyone um, got as much out of this as I did today and um, happy Earth Day. And thank you all so much. Yes, and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for joining us today. Um, it was a great discussion. Um, it was recorded, um, so we will be able to share that with everyone. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege to be part of it. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Happy Earth Day, all. Happy Earth Day.